I'm Cheryl Vogt. I'm director of the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies here at the university. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. The Russell Library staff and I are very happy to host this program, Oversight or Overlook, Intelligence in the Modern World. This event is in association with the Policy Forum of the School of Public and International Affairs, often re referred to as SPIA here on campus. We have worked together in the past, and we hope to continue our partnership on several adventures in the future. Today's program is the first Russell Library Salon event. If you would like to know more about uh, the Salon and the Russell Library itself, please refer to your program. And better yet, come by and visit us here on campus. We're on North Campus in the main library, on the west side of the library annex, on the west side facing Park Hall, across from the Terry College of Business. We have several people and groups that we would like to thank for this event, especially our co-sponsors, the UGA Alumni Association and the University of Georgia Libraries. And I'd like to give special thanks to the library's development office who have helped us significantly in organizing and arranging for this event. And especially the Russell Library staff, I would like to thank personally because they have contributed so much toward this program especially Jill Severn and Abby Adams, who have designed the literature for this program. I recognize several people in the audience who have given us support over the years, and as members of the Russell family and the Russell Foundation. It's always good to see them in the audience uh, supporting us once again. I want to thank you for your attendance today. We very much appreciate your interest in the program. We hope you'll come to uh, future Russell Library events, and currently, uh, we have a must-see exhibit at the library. It's um, Power to the People, the Story of Rural Electrification in Georgia. We're open weekdays and the first Saturday afternoons of each month. So I hope you'll come by, bring your families, and see the exhibit. Two of our panelists have new books that were published in the last quarter of 2005 that are pertinent to today's uh, topic of discussion. Uh, David Barrett um, has the books The CIA and Congress, The Untold Story, From Truman to Kennedy, which provides a provocative account of American spymasters and Capitol Hill. And Locke Johnson um, is co-author of Who's Watching the Spies? Establishing Intelligence Service Accountability. I love this cover. <laughs> um, which examines the intelligence systems of nine diverse countries, including the US, Norway, and South Korea, and it presents the strengths and weaknesses of each. Both books are being sold in the vestibule of the chapel, to, of the chapel and there's the reception following uh, in Demosthenian Hall, to which everyone is invited, and the authors will be available to autograph books following the reception, or following at the reception. The Russell Library staff has worked with uh, David Barrett, um, whom you will be introduced in a moment more formally, for 20 years as he has researched several projects um, at the library. Knowing the scope and thoroughness of the research he has done, and that he has visited more than a dozen congressional archives in his work on this particular book, we are indeed proud that he has decided to donate his research files to the Russell Library. It is, in fact, David's research uh, at the library that sparked our interest in having a campus forum uh, for discussing the timely subject of modern intellig intelligence gathering and oversight. How many of you have heard of Sunshine Week? Has anyone in the audience heard of Sunshine Week? Okay, I see a couple of hands, and I know why they have heard of Sunshine Week. Well, it's being celebrated next week for the second uh, year by the Association of Research Libraries and other information organizations. Like Sunshine Legislation, it's the call for openness in government. The Sunshine Week group is hosting a national teleconference titled, Are We Safer in the Dark? A national dialogue, dialogue on open government and secrecy to look at the problems we're facing with it, how it impacts communities, and what the public can do about it. If we stop and reflect, I venture that each of us feels the effects of information gathering 
in our personal and public lives, increasingly in recent years with the prevalence of technology in society. The significance of intelligence gathering, whether it's in, for our country's defense or for the conduct of our daily lives, has reached the heartland of America. For when libraries, the disseminators of information in every community, call for openness in government at this level, we have the bellwether of the American silent majority. This is a signal that the citizens are not, want, are not just waiting to be informed, but like you here today, they are seeking to be informed. Now I'm pleased to introduce Locke Johnson, who will introduce the other panelists and the program. Locke Johnson is Regents Professor of Public and International Affairs at the University of Georgia, and author of several books and over 100 articles on US national security. In the late 1970s, he served as Special Assistant to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and as Staff Director of the House Subcommittee on Intelligence Oversight. And and in the mid-1990s, he was special assistant to the chair of the Aspen Brown Commission on Intelligence. From 1998 to 2000, he led the founding of the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Georgia. Born in New Zealand and educated at the University of California, Professor Johnson has been on the faculty of the University of Georgia since 1979. He is the winner of the next professorship for meritorious teaching, and its Owens Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in the Field of Social Science Research. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate that very nice introduction. I want to add my welcome to all of you. It's such a treat to have the Russell family members with us here today. And I can also see, even though my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, a couple of very distinguished professors in the audience, Gary Birch and, and Homer Cooper. We're so pleased to have both of you here. Forgive me if I miss some others, because I, I don't see all that well these days, it seems. But we're so glad to have you all here. And an added uh, treat is to have people from town coming to campus. It's always a thrill for us when we have people coming from off campus to join us here. And we welcome you as, as well. And then, of course, I see our distinguished main library librarian, uh, Bill Potter. We're pleased to see you as well. I would like to introduce our panelists. And you're in for quite a treat because we have a wonderful assembly of knowledge and wisdom up here on this subject. Let me begin with the person to my immediate left and, and to your right. This is David Barrett, and David is a professor of political science at Villanova University. He has a Bachelor of Arts in American Studies from the University of Notre Dame. He was a radio news director and public affairs director for public television in South Bend, Indiana for a few years. He was a candidate for Congress in 1984 unhappily for the country and for Indiana, the people made the wrong choice and he didn't win in that election. He then decided to go for further training and received a master's degree at, in political science at the University of Essex in England and then back to Notre Dame for his PhD in political science. He's written a number of excellent books and several articles. This, this is the newest one, referred to earlier, the CIA and Congress, and this is a bit of a sensation across the country right now particularly among scholars who study the CIA, because no one really knew that much about the CIA from the period when it was created in 1947 up until the Kennedy administration. Most people have been concentrating on more recent times, and this really lays out the record beautifully and exhaustively. So it's a, it's a marvelous book, and I recommend it to you. David's also written on the Vietnam War, a, a, another great book called Uncertain Warriors, Lyndon Johnson and His Vietnam Advisors. He's won many awards, as you would expect. Among them, he had a writing residency with the Rockefeller Foundation in Bellagio, Italy, a very prestigious award. His chief scholarly interests are the presidency and the Congress in the domain of foreign and national security policy. Next over is Hal Moore, who is currently managing director of federal government relations in one of my favorite law firms in Washington, the Kinder Long and Aldridge. He was born in Milledgeville, and I'm very proud to say he graduated from this outstanding institution in 1959. He served in the Army as an infantry officer. He had the good fortune to serve with one of the greatest Georgians ever as press secretary to Senator Richard Bavard Russell from 1966 to 1971. He has also been Vice President for Legislative Affairs with Lockheed. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs 
under President Reagan, and he's been on the White House staff for a number of presidents, including Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. And then he further his, furthered his Hill experience by being chief of staff for Senator Fred Thompson of Tennessee. More recently, he's been Assistant Secretary of Defense for Legislative Affairs in the first term of the current Bush administration and received the Department of Defense's very prestigious honor, the Medal for Distinguished Public Service as a result of that time in the Pentagon. Finally, Michael Speckhard, I'm happy to say, is a, a wonderful addition here on campus to the Department of International Affairs. He's the CIA's officer in residence and teaches courses on intelligence, foreign policy, and national security. He served in the US Army for nine years in Asia and Europe, and as, as a Chinese, Mandarin, and Russian linguist. He earned a PhD in political science from the University of Houston. He has served in the Central Intelligence Agency for 15 years, providing analysis on such issues as Caspian energy, Islamic extremism, and democratic revolutions. He has been a member of the CIA's Senior Analytic Service, focusing on academic outreach and analytic integrity. While on leave down here from the CIA, he is living with his family in commerce. Let me introduce today's events by reminding you that democracy is a rather fragile form of government. It takes a lot of nurturing and a lot of time to develop into its fullness. We're seeing in Iraq the difficulty of trying to get a democracy started. There is a certain incongruous aspect to our democracy, the oldest one in the, in the world, and that is we have 16 secret agencies in our government. And the reason that's in Congress is because secrecy, one could argue, is the enemy of democracy. Yet at the same time, we need these secret agencies because someone's got to be around the world gathering information so that we can protect ourselves against threats. Now, these 16 agencies don't always get it right, as we know from our surprise attack on 9-11 and also from the errors made about predicting the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But often they do get it right, and I would argue, too, that during the Cold War, these agencies served as our first line of defense and really helped us understand the world and, and avoid a lot of very difficult situations. So we need these agencies, yet at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because they can be a danger to the Republic as well. They are large, they are secretive, they have big budgets, $44 billion a year for, for all 16. And on occasion, they have turned against the very people they were created to protect. So that we found in the 60s, the CIA was spying on American citizens illegally. We found the FBI was harassing anti-Vietnam War veterans, as well as civil rights activists. We're now in a controversy over whether or not the National Security Agency is used improperly by having it wiretapped without warrants. So these are controversial agencies. At the same time, they're in, very important for our protection. And somehow, somehow we've got to balance the requirement of national security on the one hand by having these agencies, yet on the other hand, make sure that we have appropriate safeguards to protect us against the misuse of this secret power. And that's what we're here to talk about today, how we can have these agencies, yet at the same time protect our civil liberties from the abuse of secret power. And I can't think of a better panel to talk about this subject. So let me begin in alphabetical order by turning to David Barrett. And I'd like to have each of the panelists say a few remarks about this subject. And then I'd like to pose some questions to them. David? Uh, Locke, thank you. As uh, the introduction suggested, my uh, research has been primarily in the early Cold War period. But I teach about national security policy and intelligence in the contemporary era. Uh, but I bring a lot of history to the uh, classroom at Villanova, and I, I tell my students that when Congress created uh, CAA in the summer of 1947, there were certain members in the House and the Senate who, who had fears and actually dared to express those fears bluntly uh, in, in public congressional debates. And, and what, what a few of them said is, 
Uh, well, they weren't sure if CIA should be created, and, when, and then when it was created in 1947, when they further empowered CIA in 1949, when Congress did, they expressed fears of uh, creating an American Gestapo. I think even most of those who expressed those fears, uh, and I know most of them, in fact, ended up voting to create and then empower the CIA because they, they recognized the necessity to have literally a central, that is a centralizing intelligence agency, an agency to draw on the intelligence gathered by diverse American uh, intelligence agencies to make sense of it, uh, especially in both written and spoken form, for a president and others to act on. But this, this, this problem of having these often powerful and secretive bureaucracies, uh, look, President Truman understood very well uh, and, and that it was a problem, for, a potential problem for democracy. And the interesting thing is that Truman himself, in the privacy of the White House, also said, I don't want an American uh, to stop us. So he understood, the Congress understood the necessity of having uh, uh, CIA especially, and I, I, I think if you ask most directors of central intelligence across the decades, most of them would say that the single most important uh, job, I'd be interested to hear if our uh, other panelists agree or not, but I think they would say that the most important thing is to gather the information in order to prevent, as, as they said for many decades, to prevent another Pearl Harbor, to prevent surprise attack on the United States. So that the agencies are necessary, CIA and arguably the other agencies are necessary, but how then do we monitor, do we oversee, do we regulate these agencies? And I would argue that based on the Constitution that the American citizens can at least can believe or hope that uh, the president will know what the intelligence agencies are doing, that the nation's most important elected official will know and give direction to CIA its most important activities, including covert action. But that also, because the Constitution really sort of shares foreign policy powers, uh, in my view, it's a great mistake. Uh, I often hear, or sometimes hear people say, well, the Constitution gives the president control of foreign affairs. And I, I think that's not a good reading of the Constitution. It's shared with the Congress. So I, I think that citizens can at least hope that at least certain members of Congress will also know with a, with a good deal of, of Depth, what the secret, the, the very necessary secret uh, or secret agencies are doing. So, a first response. Locke. Thank you, David. Mr. Moore. Thank you very much, Locke. And uh, let me say what a privilege it is for me to be here today, and especially to be back in Athens. There's no place like Athens in the springtime. And even though it technically is still winter, it certainly seems like spring out there. And I'm delighted to be here. It's great. <clears throat> to see so many old friends, my former uh, Russell staff colleague, Ann Pritchard, and her husband, Phil, Aubrey Morris, who is an institution in the state of Georgia, is a radio broadcast man with WSB, probably the most resourceful reporter that I encountered in my years uh, is Senator Russell's press secretary, and it's great to see so many other friends. One reason I'm glad to be back in Athens is um, that there are a lot of places I could go where the thought that a University of Georgia graduate was going to be on a panel on intelligence might produce a joke or a laugh or someplace. <laughs> but I don't have to have that in Athens. When I was in the Department of Defense, the Director of Intelligence for the Joint Staff, we call him the J-2, the Major General, who also happened to be an Auburn graduate. And I always had a great time with him, saying how frightening it was to me to think that one of the most important military staffs in the country was dependent on an Auburn man for intelligence. And so, um, but I'm glad to be here in Athens. Um, uh, I would not pass myself off as the uh, other panelist as uh, an expert on intelligence, but I think the subject today is oversight. And I have had some experience of standing on the bridge between that great chasm that separates the legislative branch from the um, uh, executive branch. Um, and it is a wide chasm, and it's, there's a lot of tension between the executive branch and the legislative branch that uh, 
has uh, been the subject of debate for many, many years. David referred to it in the question of where the real authority in foreign policy and national security affairs lies. There's been a debate that's been going on since the 18th century. And I hope we can settle it here today, but I don't <laughs> think that, that necessarily is likely. But uh, I can tell you that my experience with the intelligence community, that they are all committed Americans, uh, most everybody that I've encountered, that they are patriotic people who work hard, have the national interest at heart, and uh, probably is less interested in seeing another Gestapo uh, system established in the United States than anyone, that they work hard to protect our system of government, and uh, it would be certainly inconsistent with their mission to uh, suggest that that might be a possibility. Um, but intelligence is a very, very tough business. As David pointed out, its primary purpose is to help the nation avoid surprise, to uh, prevent surprise, and uh, that is a huge challenge. I think if you go to the Trust Department of the Sun Trust. I happen to be on the Russell Foundation board, and they manage the funds for that organization. And we are depending on them to predict economic trends and market trends in the future. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. The weather uh, bureaus that we rely on for weather. Predicting the future is extremely difficult, and sometimes we have a higher expectation from our intelligence community that maybe we should have. I think about the surprises that we have confronted and, um, about a month before my fourth birthday, David referred to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, that uh, was certainly the ultimate surprise until 911. I was uh, in Germany in the Army uh, when in August 13, 1961, a very large military operation put on by the East German military constructed a barrier between East Berlin and West Berlin in a matter of hours between dusk and dawn, uh, one overnight. The uh, original barrier was very crude. I happened to see it two weeks later, and uh, but over the years it developed and became a symbol of the contrast between the Soviet Union and the United States and between a constitutional system and a uh, dictatorship between free markets and a controlled economy. And also, we were equally surprised when that wall came down when it did. And I also have to mention that uh, the nation was surprised again. I was uh, in the Pentagon on uh, September the 11th, 2001, in a meeting across the hall from the Secretary of Defense's office in the National Command Center when we heard an explosion. It was a, uh, later learned that a plane had flown into the uh, uh, Pentagon. It was uh, a meeting that had been called to discuss the uh, situation as a result of what had happened in New York. <coughs> so surprise is, um, is in inevitable. I think you could make a long list of times that the nation has been surprised, and uh, it's uh, very easy when that happens to look back and say the signs were there, they should have picked this up, they should have picked that up, but that's a little bit disingenuous because uh, I can tell you we'll be surprised again, and uh, the intelligence community moving around boxes as we did before is not necessarily a... Um, <coughs> a uh, solution. Um, the, um, but intelligence is becoming more and more important, and the intelligence world is different than it was when Senator Russell and others were dealing uh, with the bilateral world that we faced with the Soviet Union. We have threats from a variety of uh, sources, usually non-state uh, actors, uh, the military threats from cross-border aggression from nation states is uh, really hard to identify right now. And I would have to say that that's a testimony to the strength of our Navy, our Air Force, our Army and Marine Corps, the fact that 
people don't challenge us on traditional military lines. And I have to say in this audience that a big part of the legacy of Senator Russell was in, in uh, my congressman growing up, Carl Vinson, was the fact that we do have a strong military and we are no longer threatened on those terms. Uh, we're talking about the subject of the difficulty of predicting the future. I have to tell a story that I meant to tell a few seconds ago that is kind of indicative of the difficulty. The Washington Post has frequently been uh, critical of the intelligence commu uh, community. And I had an experience with one of their uh, reporters on election day, uh, 2004, that's the notorious Bob Woodward, their investigative reporter, who I ran into on the street outside of our polling place. And he said, well, you could go back to the private sector because the election is over. Our uh, 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 exit polls show that uh, John Kerry is sweeping the nation and it's going to be a change in the administration in January and you're no longer going to have a job. So I saw him at a Christmas party about a month later, and I said, Bob, I said, you know, you would qualify to be a good director of central intelligence in a Kerry administration. <laughs> those kinds of uh, predictions, um, you uh, would challenge some of the people who held that position. And he looked at me and he said, well, I never said it was going to be a slam dunk. So, um, question of oversight. Is it working? Um, under our separation of powers, the um, Congress provides the money for the Army, the Navy, and the Central Intelligence, and every other aspect of our life. They do it as long as they don't face a presidential veto, which can be overridden by two-thirds. But uh, obviously, they have a big responsibility to uh, make sure that the money, the $44 billion that David referred to for defense is properly spent. But that doesn't necessarily mean that micromanagement of the central intelligence or the community of the intelligence community is necessarily going to be a good thing. And I'll have to say that we have, uh, the oversight process has become very partisan we saw evidence of it today, or in the paper today, that happened yesterday, uh, with a bickering between the chairman of the um, uh, Senate Intelligence Committee and uh, the ranking minority member, Senator Rockefeller, over the issue of how the committee was going to handle the question of the NSA surveillance. And um, I think in that regard, I was kind of taken by a quotation of Senator Roberts that I'll read, which I agree with, that when it comes to national security, I prefer accommodation to confrontation. We should fight the enemy. We should not fight each other. And there's too much fighting of each other and too much partisanship. We have a feeling sometimes when you're in the executive branch that there are members on the Hill who see the relationship between the committee and the executive branch, like the criminal division at the Justice Department looks at organized crime. Even one said, and was quoted in the um, Detroit Free Press, that it's my job to find favor. And when you have that kind of environment in oversight, it breeds a lot of uh, caution on the part of people who are involved in intelligence and uh, it can be highly counterproductive. Now, the 911 Commission that uh, produced its results maybe a year and a half ago did a tremendous job of telling us exactly what happened leading up and subsequent to 911 and where we might have improved our national response. And uh, I would have to say, in spite of the, the quality of that report and the conscientious effort that took place that they um, uh, kind of fell somewhat short in their recommendations 
but they um, did come up with a, a few worthwhile recommendations. And the one that I would embrace the, uh, the quickest is what they said about congressional oversight. They used the word dysfunctional <coughs> to describe congressional oversight. And they proposed an approach like was taken in the late 40s uh, when the federal establishment in Washington was faced with the difficulty that came with the awesome thought that we now contain, have uh, a uh, weapons capability uh, that had serious implications about the future of mankind. And they set up what was called the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And the 911 Commission recommended intelligence oversight should pattern itself after the uh, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which had nine from one house, nine from the other. They had a single staff. They operated to a large extent behind uh, in, in, in a classified environment so that they could honestly deal in a constructive way with the leadership in the administration, and uh, in terms of oversight, that would be where I would come down so that we could set up a calm and constructive dialogue between Congress and the executive branch that would lead to an environment where we can avoid future surprises and uh, work in a constructive way to protect this country, all of its uh, values and its institutions. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Dr. Secco. Well, let me join the other panelists in expressing my pleasure at being here today. It, it is beautiful in Athens, and I enjoyed the long drive down from Commerce. Definitely a worthwhile trip. Uh, based on Dr. Johnson's introduction, I guess we've had knowledge and wisdom, and since I have neither, I'm here to offer experience. Uh, I've been asked to make some comments on the oversight process from someone inside uh, the intelligence community. In general, we use Mark Lowenthal's definition, the core oversight issue is whether the intelligence community is properly carrying out its functions. We understand that that's what oversight is all about. It is to a certain extent, of course, Congress wanting to make sure that the money that it has appropriated for these purposes is properly spent. But ultimately, from our point of view as intelligence professionals, what we all want to see is exactly the type of job performance that my esteemed colleagues here have expressed. No more surprises, or if there are surprises, better warning. Uh, good intelligence, information, analysis, and a capability for the president and others in conducting national security. Some of the questions that Mark Lowenthal uh, suggests come out of this core definition are questions that we all deal with every day and, and spend a lot of time worrying about. Are we asking the right questions? Are we responding to policymakers' needs? Are we being rigorous in our analysis? And do we have the right operational capacities? I'm an analyst, and so I, I have the most experience on the first three of those questions, and that's really where I'd like to focus uh, my brief remarks. We are intelligence professionals. We're also citizens. And like all of the rest of you, we have the same concerns. We share the same concerns. It is a delicate balance in a free and open society like ours to have the need for organizations like the CIA. And we're very aware, we're in fact probably better aware of that delicate balance than many others simply because we deal with it every day. None of us, and here I certainly echo the comments made earlier, none of us wants to see anything like a Gestapo or, or a KGB or any of the other examples that are out there. Given that we have this difficult balance to maintain, between the free and open society that we all value and the sometimes necessity for secrecy in protecting our national security, we welcome the accountability that oversight brings because it's only through that accountability that this balance can be maintained. And in a sense, we've talked about the Constitution. One of the, 
one of the chief insights of the founding fathers was that they based the Constitution not on what they wanted, but on what they felt human nature provided. We're all fallible human beings, and any system that depends on us being better than the average person is doomed to failure. And ultimately then, in the intelligence business, we understand and we value the same level of accountability that the rest of our government should be subject to, in particular the accountability to the voters, to the people that make up this country. For instance, and I'll give you an example here, one of the questions that Lowenthal poses. We as intelligence professionals are supposed to be responsive to policymakers. If I get a request from someone at the Department of Defense for an assessment, it's my job to be receptive to that, to be responsive to that. On the other hand, it is also my job as an intelligence professional to quote unquote speak truth to power. That is, I'm not doing my job. If in being responsive to the policymaker, I'm just telling him or her whatever they want to hear. We saw an example of the difficulty of maintaining this balance in the uh, hearings that accompanied the uh, nomination of Bob Gates to be the DCI back in 1991. And uh, some of the uh, partisanship that you mentioned, battle lines were quickly drawn. But in a sense, the battle lines were drawn because it's a genuinely controversial issue. How far do you go as an intelligence professional in being responsive the policymaker, without crossing the line and no longer being objective in your analysis. On the other hand, do you place such an insistence on being objective that you're not responsive at all to the policymaker that you were hired to support? This is a difficult issue. There's no cut and dry, right and wrong answer. And what I'm suggesting in agreement with, with my colleagues here, is that one of the best ways of ensuring that we get the balance as right as possible is being subject to the accountability that oversight brings. Now, I understand that a lot of the focus on oversight here is on congressional oversight. I just, and, and I don't have much to say about that because I have a much less experience than either of my colleagues here on this, or Dr. Johnson as well. Um, I have more experience with internal accountability, and uh, I'd just like to mention that briefly. There's also accountability that comes from within the executive branch. And that is an accountability that's carried out on a regular basis. It starts in, uh, with, the, with the White House, the NSC, and it flows over into my own organization. I've had a lot of experience over the last 15 years, for example, with our Inspector General, which is an internal organ of accountability that uh, is busy on a regular basis with these issues. I've experienced with internal task forces and with external commissions of the type that were mentioned here, the 9-11 Commission and others. All of these uh, methods of accountability are welcome. We can never get it perfectly right. We live in a world where 100% accuracy is simply impossible. And for anybody who wants that, if, if you ever discover it, there's a lot of money waiting for you in Las Vegas. You could let me know who's going to win the next Super Bowl. I, I'd be very happy. But in, in, in the same way that we'll never get every football prediction or basketball prediction right, if we set ourselves up in the prediction business, we are never going to get it right. But we should, not lose, we should not let that discourage us from trying to do better. And I think that's the real value of accountability, both at the congressional level and internally within the executive branch. As professionals, we should all commit ourselves and remain committed to doing better. And I, uh, I speak on behalf of a, a lot of people in the intelligence community when I say that we are all dedicated to continuing to do our best to help the legislative branch and other parts of the executive branch get it as right as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Streckhardt. There's, there's a certain paradox here, it seems to me, because I would agree with Mr. Moore 
that if you get to know the people in the intelligence community and these 16 agencies, they're among the most talented people you will ever meet. You'd be very proud of them, I think. They work very hard, they're well educated, but things go wrong. And I think it's because of the nature of, of, of the human personality. A, a U.S. senator from the state of Georgia wants to find oversight for me this way, trying to keep the bureaucrats from doing something stupid. And I think that all organizations will from time to time do something stupid, or they'll succumb to the temptations of misusing power. I know all my students out in the audience know Lord Acton's famous aphorism, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so there's something about power that can distort what even good people mean to do, and that's why we are here to talk about oversight or accountability. How do you monitor these agencies, both inside and from Capitol Hill, and from the judiciary for that matter, to make sure stupid things don't happen, that there aren't scandals and failures? And let me remind you, just very briefly, back in 1975, it's very clear these agencies were spying on American citizens inappropriately. And then, of course, you had the Iran-Contra scandal during the 80s, where, again, intelligence was misused against the laws of Congress that prohibited covert action in Nicaragua. And then, of course, we have failures from time to time, 9-11 and WMDs in Iraq only being the most recent. Now, some of these failures will be inevitable because, as the panelists have, taught, have pointed out properly, no one has a crystal ball, and we're never going to be able to predict the future perfectly. But let me return to the panelists and, and pose this question to, to anyone who would like to answer it. More specifically, what do we mean by oversight? Give me some practical examples of how oversight might be carried out. Uh, could I answer by doing a little bit of uh, a brief history lesson for the audience here? I just want to speak about how oversight was done and how sort of the Please. system changed, but it's going to be a very brief history. For the first um, 25 or years or so of CIA's existence, the way that Congress monitored CIA, CIA, or to the extent that it did so, it did so primarily through four tiny subcommittees, appropriation and armed services subcommittees for both House and Senate. This is how it was done from 1947 through roughly the mid 19 70s when the Church Committee of the Senate and the, and the Pike Committee of the House sort of brought about uh, changes to what we have today. So the monitoring, the oversight that Congress did in that era uh, was, compared to today, certainly informal, I would say limited compared to how it's been done in recent decades. It certainly was not non-existent, and, and so the, the reason my book turns out to be so thick is there were actually quite a few cases of members of Congress uh, Senator Russell and certain others periodically becoming assertive in relation to CIA. Uh, it was not systematic, but one thing that was good about it is that when you had the right person leading as chair or ranking minority member, and they often worked in tandem in that era, which is pretty amazing, uh, when there was a perceived intelligence failure on the part of CIA, uh, frankly, one thing that a, that, a, that a director of CIA would say would be uh, well, to give you one example, when CIA failed to predict uh, the Soviet Union's first test explosion of an atomic bomb, this was in 1949, the intelligence, uh, CIA and the other agencies had thought it would be, well, probably 51, 52, 1953. Suddenly it was 1949. Caught the president by surprise, caught CIA by surprise. The truth is the head of CIA had done a good job of trying to get the technologies working that could have detected that, but we just weren't moving quickly enough. Anyway. I want to tell you, uh, that poor man was skinned alive by, uh, by a in, a in a congressional hearing. Um, so, so they could be assertive in the old days, but there, there were not much in the way of structures built in uh, to the Congress for monitoring of CA. So there was a revolution, really, in the mid-1970s. And out of the, in the 1970s, due to the Church Committee, the Pike Committee, books that were written, articles written by Seymour Hersh and others, uh, Congress uh, decided that it needed to be more systematic. So in roughly the mid-70s, both the House and the Senate, uh, instead of creating this, this joint committee idea, was a, an idea that Senator Mike Mansfield and others had pushed uh, during these early years of CA's existence, but finally when Congress did create a more systematic type of oversight, it created uh, committees uh, independent of each other. So a House Committee on Intelligence, Senate Committee on Intelligence. They are, they are fairly large. Uh, they have substantial staffs, substantial budgets, and so 
who have been now functioning for uh, almost, uh, it's, it's approaching three decades now. So there's a lot, there's a lot more, on the one hand, it, it would seem that there's more oversight going on, although I have to say, and again, I'm interested in the re reactions of the rest of you, it seems to me that there's still uh, an awful lot of uh, misperformance by the intelligence committees. Uh, my view is that the House and Senate committees in recent years have not been properly assertive in relation to certain intelligence uh, uh, controversies. I'm coming to believe more and more that while structures matter, so it really does matter that the Congress, that the House and the Senate created full intelligence committees. I think that matters, Locke, and I think it mattered, uh, uh, Dr. Speckhardt and Mr. Uh, Mr. Moore. But I also think that people matter. And I think when you've got the wrong people heading committees or, or subcommittees, I mean, in the old days, there were, there were these two, if I can tell one story, these two men who alternated as House Appropriations Chair, and they in turn alternated, uh, depending upon which party had the Congress, they alternated heading the House Appropriations Subcommittee on CIA. These men, Clarence Cannon and John Tabor, no one remembers them anymore. I want to tell you, when you've been in Congress, no matter how powerful and you know, famous you think you are, I want to tell you, when you're dead and gone, Richard Russell's a rare exception. Russell is remembered, but most powerful members of Congress, when they're dead and gone, they're forgotten. Anyway, Clarence Cannon, John Tabor, they were not nice guys. They were skin flints. Neither one had an actual friend in the, in, in the House of Representatives. <coughs> uh, but they were tough in relation. They, they believed in CAA, they supported CAA, but they were tough. They, were, they asked tough questions. Clarence Cannon, and my point here is that who's in the chairmanship matters. Clarence Cannon said to Alan Dulles in 1959, uh, how much does the US government spend on intelligence each year? Dulles could not answer the question. He headed CIA. His title was Director of Central Intelligence, and that title implied that he was supposed to coordinate the entire intelligence uh, uh, establishment, but he didn't know. Cannon kept saying over the period of a year, I want to know. And it, it, it forced people at CIA to work with the other intelligence agencies, finally to be able to say to Cannon, what they also in then informed President Eisenhower, how much we spent each year on intelligence. So we didn't even know until 1959 or 60 what we've been spending on intelligence for the preceding decades. So I think who's in the leadership of, of committees matters a lot. Mr. Moore, you might comment, if you would, on the concept of micromanagement. I agree with you that Congress shouldn't be involved in micromanagement, but how far should they go? Uh, I would... Uh, on one comment that you made, Dr. Johnson, is that oversight is a uh, function of trying to keep bureaucrats from do, doing something stupid. I don't mind, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing Congress because I made my living there and I love Congress and the people I've known. But I don't know who's going to stop members of the House and the Senate from doing <laughs> something stupid. Well, presumably the uh, voters should take care of that, but they don't. Well, they don't always. So, uh, and, and sometimes they don't don't know about it. But uh, that that's a good question. I, I think that the that the primary uh, function of Congress is uh, to oversee the appropriate use of funds. Now, that can go a long, long way. And um, I, um, but um, there is a mentality that exists now that's kind of an investigative mentality. That, uh, you know, there's a tendency because of the mistakes that have been made, and I'm not going to, uh, I could have told you in 1981 that Oliver North was the wrong person to be in the National Security Council staff to begin with, and to be given, or given as much authority that he was given by 1985, 1986 was just a, um, it was mind-boggling, but uh, the, um, um, it, it's a function of, of picking the right people and uh, in the executive branch to, to make this work. But um, one of the problems we have with congressional oversight, and as I say, I love Congress, uh, I draw a retirement check from daughter, my son, both employed by Congress, so uh, I, uh, I don't want to uh, sound too unkind, but there are a few things about the way Congress functions uh, that makes it difficult to, uh, to, 
properly oversee uh, intelligence. The uh, separation of intelligence from policy, which is very important. I know when Dick Helms was the uh, director of Central Intelligence, he was talked about in his book how he went to the National Security Council meeting and he presented the uh, uh, intelligence analysis and then he left for the policy discussion. And uh, Dr. Kissinger, in his testimony leading up to the uh, intelligence uh, reform last year, talked about the uh, importance of uh, separating intelligence uh, from policy. Congress has a hard time doing that. They are creature of politics. They also have a hard time focusing on things that are not in the headlines. I can give you a lot of examples when we've asked for opportunities to come up and testify or consult uh, when they say, well, we're not really interested in that big right now. But a week later, when it shows up in the newspaper, they become very interested. And so, um, and also, Congress, intelligence is not a part-time activity. But uh, unfortunately, Congress is kind of a part-time institution. You have in the House of Representatives no votes until Tuesday night, and uh, the last votes on Thursday afternoon. And if you're going to talk to members of Congress, and you're in the executive branch during that time, you have to do it between Wednesday morning and sundown on Thursday. And uh, the calendar doesn't always work that way in the executive branch. Uh, the intelligence world doesn't necessarily recognize August recesses and recesses for Christmas and all of that. And so their ability to, um, to um, oversee is limited by their nature. So they should do what they can focus on and do best, and that's to uh, judge how the money is being spent. Thank you. Dr. Speckhart, you mentioned internal accountability. Let's say we have an analyst who's not doing a good job Maybe he's spinning intelligence to please someone in the White House, or maybe he's just plain incompetent. What checks are there to do something about that? Well, a number of checks. Uh, first and foremost, the management chain within uh, CIA or other intelligence organizations. Um, all of us have drilled into us from day one, and there is an extensive training process. Uh, the the importance of professionalism, things like impartiality, objectivity, speaking truth to power, the separation of intelligence and policy, so on and so forth. We have a, uh, a promotion system, like any other government organization, we're graded on how well we do those things on a regular basis. If someone's not performing or is engaged in the types of activities you mentioned, that will show up, and that person by and large, won't advance within the system. That's a powerful incentive, and I speak from personal experience, um, when you live in the D.C. area, you need to get promoted in order to survive uh, as housing prices and everything else goes up. And so uh, that's a powerful incentive to do your job right. Mm -hmm. um, if that system breaks down, if that system's not working, then, of course, you've got a problem. My experience over the last 15 years, and I think, you know, there's just a tendency, uh, and it, again, I, I can't speak to Congress, I, and I wouldn't even if I could. Um, no sense in, in making people angry uh, unnecessarily who signed the check. But, uh, you know, there is a tendency to, to focus on mistakes, and one of the things I've noticed is this kind of throw the hands up in the air syndrome where, there seems to be a tendency to say it's broken, it's broken, it's broken. And um, it, it just, it seems to me, uh, based on my experience, that my organization has been doing its job. Other organizations, Department of Defense, have been doing their job. Congress is doing its job. Mistakes are made, and, and again, we all want to do better. We all want to do better on a continuous basis. Um, but the systems that are in place, while they can be improved on a regular basis, let's give credit where credit is due. Um, and by and large, my experience has been the system that work. I would point out that the budget for the intelligence community has gone from $20 billion in 1980 to $44 billion today. So I would conclude from that that the Congress has been rather supportive of these agencies, even though occasionally they've been critical. 
I, I think we ought to wrap this up a little bit up here before we go to questions from the audience by talking about possible reforms of oversight. One has already been placed before us, that is to have a single oversight committee instead of two separate ones, one in the House and one in the Senate. I wonder what Dr. Barrett thinks about that idea. Uh, well, Mr. Moore mentioned, <coughs> you said one committee earlier, right? <coughs> Mr. Moore mentioned the idea of having a joint committee of Congress, there be a joint committee on intelligence for Congress. And do you know someone raised that issue from before the House of Representatives in 1948, so it's an idea that's been around a long time, and it's never actually, it's never been tried. Uh, and I have to say, maybe because I, I, I think I come at it from a different angle than you, but I've been pondering a lot the last year or two whether we might be better off to have one congressional committee that is a joint committee. Uh, maybe not have it be so big, like maybe, because what is the, uh, is it the Senate committee 15 or so lost and the House committee is 18 or 19, something like that? Oh, boy. It's, uh, it seems to me maybe that's just just too big, and I, 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 I've begun to wonder how many members of, of the current House and Senate Intelligence Committees are really taking their membership on those committees seriously. I wonder if there were a joint committee, which were smaller, uh, if, if those who would, would serve on it would, would perhaps feel this tremendous sense of responsibility to actually devote a significant part of their work life to uh, survey on such committees. I don't, by the way, see any prospect that the House and the Senate are going to do this, but, but the September 11th Commission did recommend it. It's somewhat fuzzily, but they recommended it. I, I wonder, because frankly, uh, and you, you said that you think oversight is primarily it's sort of monitoring the spending, how the money's being spent. I, I, well, I think it's a lot more than just providing for the spending and monitoring how it's spent. I mean, I really think there needs to be a serious and, and fairly systematic uh, examination of, of how the, the function of the agencies is going on. But I think maybe, maybe, a joint committee would do that more than the two committees have. Uh, I, I am aware that Locke, in your writings, and by the way, Locke Johnson, in my view, is the, sort of the leading political scientist in the, in the country on intelligence topics. And I know, I have the sense from you that you think that the committees have performed relatively well across these decades, and so you might be less enthusiastic. I, I, I'm at least wondering if there, perhaps there should not be a joint committee, because I'm not I say this mainly as a citizen. I'm not satisfied with the work that the two committees have done in the last few years. The uh, joint, there's, there's a model for the joint committee, uh, and that's the joint committee on atomic energy, which functioned very well from about 1947 until uh, the kind of partisan breakdown that occurred in the, uh, in the 1970s. And, uh, the uh, uh, policymakers were very concerned about the great responsibility that went with having a weapon when it was so devastating. And, so, and the, what the implications of atomic power represented. So they uh, set up a system called the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Each house had nine members, a total of 18. That's equal to the, that's less than what the House of Representatives has on their committee right now. Uh, they uh, were staffed with, I mean, the members of the committee were the elder statesmen. Senator Russell was a member, Senator Jackson was a member, Howard Baker, John Pastore, uh, and uh, they uh, were serious people who uh, devoted a lot of time uh, to the issue. And um, uh, it's uh, one of the weaknesses of the system right now. There's a system of term limits, eight uh, years. You own the Intelligence Committee eight years, and then you have to leave. And so that means that most everybody who serves on the Intelligence Committee are kind of in a learning process over a period of eight years. And so term limits are a bad idea. Well, I might, I might so, note that finally the two committees have changed that. They've taken that ceiling off. So yeah, that's right. Probably a good thing to do. I promised the organizers of this event that at 4 o'clock I would open up to the audience which all of us look forward to. So if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. In an ideal world, uh, the congressional, uh, the intelligence committees could be counted on to be sure that that sort of thing never happens. The, the committees could be counted on to look into the question of whether people who were uh, not terrorists are being held without due process. I think, I mean, you posed the question, I think, half humorously, but I think it's a serious 
question too, and uh, I think it's it's a very good question. I'd like to know more what the other panelists think. Uh, I think that the thing that protects you from doing that is the Constitution of the United States. But um, we have um, uh, the people who are in Guantanamo are primarily enemy combatants, and the position of the administration is that we are at war. Uh, if we have any American citizens down there, I'm not aware of it. And uh, I guess we had one who, uh, who was given due process. But, uh, uh, I will not acknowledge that we have been very slow in pulling together our um, uh, approach to processing detainees in terms of military commissions and so forth. But we did commission a number of very distinguished Americans to, uh, uh, to make those kinds of judgments in the commission process. But it's been hung up in the courts. Uh, Judge Bell is one, Griffin Bell. You ask him, he's a major general in the United States Army. He was commissioned as a result of this. Former uh, Secretary of Tra Transportation, Bill Coleman. And, um, um, but I think you have to put some reliance on the fact that the administration is run by a man who got over 270 electoral votes and uh, that uh, you have to have some confidence in the good faith of uh, the national leadership that this process is not going to be abused. And I think that in terms of handling detainees, and that could open up a whole new discussion that the administration has probably gotten a bad rap on a lot that's going on. We've had a lot of members of Congress who've been down to Guantanamo and have come back with impressions, and not necessarily Republicans, that, uh, that they're being treated humanely and uh, with out of fitting them with prosthetics and providing them with medical care and a lot of things that reflect the values of the United States of America. I would think what they would want more than prosthetics, perhaps, is an attorney in due process, which we've not given them. And I personally think it's been a shameful record. And I go to international conferences and people in Europe and elsewhere will come up to me and say, we love the United States. How could you have failed us this way by what you've done at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib? So there is a lot of controversy about this. Yes, sir. I think that's right that Congress has spoken. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, Congress, in very, Congress at large, in very substantial ways, has given uh, great powers to the president, to the presidency in recent years. Uh, but I distinguish, though, in mean, speaking about the committees, my, I have problems with what the, uh, the intelligence committees have done and not done, but I agree with you. Congress at large has empowered this president and the presidency. Well, it probably should be noted that a sizable minority in Congress are worried about some aspects of the Patriot Act. And we have librarians with us today, and I know there are librarians across this country who wonder about the FBI coming into their building and requesting records without uh, appropriate warrants or, or due protection. So it does remain controversial. I think your point is well taken. This has been supported by the Congress, but let's don't overlook some of the controversial aspects that linger with respect to the Patreon Act. What else can we do to, if we want to, maybe we don't want to, to improve oversight when it comes to intelligence? If I could just mention, uh, <clears throat> I think one of the things uh, that we talk about in the intelligence community is... Uh, and I want to make an analogy, going back to this issue of one of our main jobs being to be responsive to the policymaker. And, and a good part of that means educating policymakers because our policymakers change every four years or so. And uh, part of our job is to help policymakers understand what we can and can't do for them and what we're in a position to do for them and what they should, as educated consumers of our product, what they should look for and ask for and demand from us. And I think in that vein, one of the things the intelligence community, perhaps, we could uh, do for our part to improve the oversight processes 
is perhaps try and do that with, with the legislative branch. Perhaps, and I know a certain amount of that goes on, but I think we, we ought to be in the business also of helping to educate uh, congressional staff and, and Congress people who are very busy and, and have a lot on their plate and perhaps uh, were not always the first thing on their mind. So that as, as uh, in their oversight capacity, they have a more uh, educated understanding of what it is they should be looking for and the kinds of questions they should be asking, the things they should be demanding from us. Uh, again, in the sense of perhaps uh, helping make them better consumers uh, as well as better watchdogs of what we do. With regard to the Intelligence Committee, how complete should the clearance and um, access to information be for members of those two committees? Mr. Moore? Well, uh, security clearance are, are, um, are extended by the um, uh, executive branch, and under our system of separated powers, we don't provide clearances for members of Congress. If they're elected by the um, American people who uh, serve here, uh, they are provided with access to a minimum of uh, top secret uh, clearance. Now, there's some compartmented programs that uh, only the chairman and ranking on the intelligence committee have access to. But uh, the uh, members of Congress are not clear. Uh, their staffs have to be clear. And uh, that's almost a full-time job when you consider the size of the staff of the two intelligence committees these days. Uh, that uh, uh, members of Congress are not clear. Can it, I speak to that? Yes, please. Well, I think I think it's a, an important point that again the members of the of the committees don't have to go through this clearance process because they are elected by. Uh, by the people, and again, especially with regard to those on these two committees. I want to speak to the law, though. With all these controversies going on, I, I wanted to, for myself, revisit what's in the law with regard to the knowledge, the right of knowledge of members of the two committees with regard to covert action and then intelligence gathering programs. With regard to covert action, you can say as a starting point that the two committees have a right to know in advance of significant covert action. However, there, there are procedures for limiting uh, the advance notification and certainly limited just to certain members or a few key other members of Congress. So there are some significant uh, limits uh, with regard to covert action. But you know, I looked at the law again, and I don't think that I misread it. And it seems to me that it's quite clear with regard to um, intelligence gathering operations, or for example, this NSA program, that the committees, the committees, the members of the two committees have a right to know about uh, of the existence, the operation of these programs. What, the only thing that can be withheld from the two full committees, according to the law, uh, would be certain operational aspects of how these things are carried out, so some sort of hypersensitive aspects of the operations. But the existence, the functioning, sort of the overview of the, uh, any intelligence gathering operations, uh, the, the full memberships of the two committees, according to the law, have a right to know. So that's kind of the core, I'd say, of this current controversy. Is the law being abided by or not? I should grant that some people look at that same law and somehow think it means something different from what I just said. So therein lies the controversy. Yes, that's the idea. If you're going to monitor these 16 agencies and do it properly in order to make good laws in the future regarding them, shouldn't you know the full range of activities that they're involved in with the exception of some very delicate methodologies or methods and the names of agents, which of course are kept very closely held. But generally, if you're going to have oversight and you don't want it to become overlooked, then you've got to know what's going on. I'm teaching a course on intelligence this semester, and I'm using one of Dr. Johnson's books, a recent book called Strategic Intelligence. And I could learn to love this man. <laughs> Well, I just want to put in a plug. There's actually an article uh, in that, a lengthy article in that book um, that speaks exactly that issue, but it doesn't do so in the recent context. It points out that this has been an issue that has been with us since the CIA was created. And the conclusion of the article, which I think the author makes a fairly persuasive case, is that uh, politicization tends to become a problem uh, in times of... Uh, greater levels of uh, political 
fighting within Washington in, in a larger context. And in times when the, the system is not as uh, politicized, um, that is less of a problem. And so we found politicization being a big issue in the 80s. Um, it was a big issue in the 90s, but with the roles reversed, Republican Congress, Democratic administration, and it's a big issue in this particular, it's not new, it's not something that just suddenly started happening in 2003. If I could just add, you know, there were charges of politicization back in the 1940s and through the 1950s and through the 1960s. And, uh, you know, my own view is when I look at some of the charges uh, from that era, a lot of the charges made against the Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, even Johnson administrations, a lot of the charges made against them of politicizing intelligence, I think in a number of cases they were in fact not really guilty, not guilty of the politicization, the, the distorting, the cherry picking of intelligence, and so on. So I don't want to sound like I think that presidents or administrations are always guilty of this sort of thing. But in any case, part of what you're asking is should the in, intelligence committees uh, examine uh, questions of alleged politicization? It seems to me the answer is yes. In the spirit of openness and further dialogue, we are going to adjourn to the building next door, and we invite you to talk with us further about this. In the meantime, I hope you'll agree with me that we've been very lucky to have such three outstanding panelists. <laughs>